Okay, my brothers, inshallah, if you want to ask any questions, please um, just tell us, raise your hand, inshallah. And we have some questions from the sister, we're going to address one, inshallah. Um, Shaykhi, there's one sister she's asking, is it true when you sin so much and when you get older, Allah seals your heart if you don't change? Yeah, there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam that says that if a man reaches the age of 60 something, I'm not sure exactly what number it was. You know? Yusuf in the Kashim. There is an authentic hadith that the Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if a man reaches a particular age and he didn't stop sinning, then there's no hope for him. That hadith is authentic. But that hadith, the explanation of that hadith is that it was said for a zajr, just to, it was said to warn, to make you afraid of being that man. Because we know if a person sins and he sins and he sins and he sins, Allah could forgive any and everything. If he sins and he turns to Allah, Allah forgive the individual. So that hadith is to make a person like afraid. Don't be that case. Because that could be you. Now, so it is authentic. I'll send that hadith back to someone and I hope you can let them know that that hadith is authentic. I just don't know the wording like that. The age of 60. What's the hadith? Ain't The Prophet, he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا بَلَكَ الرَّجُلُ السِّتِينَ that's it. Man, look at this. This, this computer is something else, man. It's, uh, <laughs> Allah doesn't accept like the excuse of the person who reaches the age of 60 وَمَا بَقِيَةُ الْحَدِيثِ Allah allowed a man to live to the age of 60 years old He allowed him that time And he hit 60 And then the guy he didn't make toba for the stuff that he did So the hadith is for zajr It's not saying that the guy If you hit 60 you still sin and you won't get forgiven Allah will forgive any and every sin. Brothers? And the hadith is a sign Bukhari, he said. Yes, yes. And the hadith is a sign Bukhari, please, this is. Brothers, do you have any question for the Sheikh, inshallah, in relation to the topic? Yeah, you can. They talked about the level of cooperation and the, 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 the difference of unity. And that's, that's one of the questions that came up. The difference between the people of Allah and the people of Allah like, like that. And um, when it comes to defending those people, um, when they're attacked because they're Muslims, um, how far do they have to go? And the brother wants to know, as it relates to the 12 Imams, the Ethna Ashariya, the Ethna Ashariya, the 12 Imams, the Shiite, of Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. Yemen, Lebanon, these people, Pakistan, Afghanistan, these people who curse the prophets, who curse the companions. How far do we go when it comes to defending their rights? Defending them. How far do we go? Should we defend them? <clears throat> I think it's fair and it's just because one of the signs of Ahlul Sunnah and Jamaat is justice. We're just. Ahlul Sunnah and Jamaat are just. Whether the truth is for them or against them, they go wherever the truth goes. So, the regular people from those individuals, they're ignorant. They're ignorant. They're like some of our relatives who believe crazy things in Al-Islam about the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They believe, some people from our relatives believe Rasulullah is sitting here with us right now. He knows everything. We, they believe crazy stuff. Understand? So they're ignorant. So we're not going to say those regular people outside of Islam. 
and we won't say that about their people as well. So if they're getting killed or something like that happens, we have to look at the situation. We have to look at, I'm not gonna say do this and don't do that. A situation like that, if that were to happen, then I would say, let the scholars of El Islam who have the ability to judge and weigh all of the variables and factors, let them make that decision and then we're behind them in something like that. They were behind them. But as I said, some of the things that they say are so egregious and outrageous that anyone who has an iota of Iman, when he hears something like that, it makes him upset. So if something were to happen to that individual, it's easy for him to say, to forsake him and not to help him. Easy. Shafi, in regards to um, Halloween, this is a question saying, can you just warn the kids about Halloween and at the same time, if someone just came and knocked on the door, uh, you know, for trick or treating, are they allowed to give them something? There is a talk on Halloween on YouTube. You go back to that and watch the details of the history of Halloween and why we do not practice not only Halloween, but every single celebration that the non-Muslims have. You know, we're in the new Islamic calendar. This is the month of Al-Muharram, and this is the new year, 1437. The Prophet he knew the months of the year. The ayat of the Quran that Allah Ta'ala mentioned about uh, The number of months to Allah is 12. It was like that the day he created the heavens and the earth. Prophet knew all of those months, but he didn't have a calendar, an official calendar. So he died. Sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Bakr came. Abu Bakr didn't have an official calendar. And then Umar came. And then when Umar came, it is reported that Abu Musa Ash'ari sent him a letter, a few letters. Abu Musa said, Amir Mubini Umar, write down, I advise, write down when did you send this letter so I can keep a record of it. So he called those companions together and said, what do you people think we should do? Some people said, let's do what the Byzantines do and the, the Byzantines and the Persians. Let's use one of their calendars. Umar said no. And one of the reasons why Umar said no is that when you use the calendar of those people, it's going to touch three things that I told you guys we cannot mess around in these three things. And it's to do with this Halloween stuff. Anything from the Ibadat of El Islam, we don't take any of that from these people. None of it. They can say we're anti-sociable, they can say we're extreme. This is something there is no room for us to move in. We want community co cohesion. We're gonna tell them from the beginning to the end, we won't take any of your ibadah. Nothing will we take from you any ibadah. We also won't take from you anything from your aqidah. Your aqidah, our aqidah, your mu'taqah, what we believe, we're not taking a fraction from you. They say, but community cohesion, you must. We're going to say, we can't, we won't, never, ever, ever do that. And then the third thing is the aid of the non-Muslims. The aid of the non-Muslims, the Muslim is not supposed to take any aid from them people. No. But if it is a part of uh, making da'wah sheikh, if somebody else is a Muslim, get invited by a and, Muslim. And, and the and reason a chance, why... Sorry, sheikh, is a chance to uh, make da'wah to them. And the, re acceptable. and the reason why we don't take the aid from them is number one, the Prophet told his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he saw them doing an Eid, in Allah, Allah has given you what is better than that. We have the Eid for the Aqiqah. We have the Eid and Adha, Eid and Fitr. We have the Friday Eid. We have the celebration when you get married. We have celebrations for so many things. His boy memorized the Quran. So the father's gonna throw a party. Because he memorized Surah Al-Baqarah. Abdullah bin Umar used to slaughter an animal because he 
finish Bakara. So we're gonna do stuff in our religion. As for their celebrations, all of them, without any exception, is built upon shit. Kufr. I'm coming to that. All of them are built upon shirk and kufr, without any exception. All of them. So how is the Muslim going to do that? The other thing, Akhi, is it's one thing to give dawah, and it's another thing to change the religion. When the people start making istihsan and they start saying, why don't we do this because we could, and this when we get in trouble. The Prophet had the ability to do that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had the ability. Those people came and they said, okay, we can't stop this religion. It's getting bigger, it's bigger, it's getting bigger, bigger, bigger. We can't stop it. So now that it's still growing, let's offer him a bride. They said, listen, Ya Muhammad, we're going to worship Allah for one whole year. And you worship our gods the next year. That's, that's a golden opportunity. Today, people would have jumped on that. They would have rolled the bicycle until they would roll it till the wheels fall off on that one. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, no, no. And the surah, Ya Ayyul Kafirun was revealed in this regard. Lakum dinukum niyadin. So anyway, if there is a thing that they have that's universal, he had a baby, he had a baby, somebody died, uh, he got married, now Muslims I'm talking about. Those kind of things, kid graduated, those are not official celebrations of those. That's the universal stuff. You can congratulate them on things like that. We're talking about Halloween, Christmas, Easter, uh, that stuff, you know, these, these types of things. Well, so sorry, Chef. Uh, I didn't say that because I believe in their religion or their cultures being like that. It's a good chance then, say, to show them our, um, our kindness uh, as a Muslim. As a Prophet, as Allah said, as you mentioned in your... Um, in the Jewish boy. Uh, yes, about the Jewish boy. Yeah. He went to him, he was, there was a connection, he was working for him, and he went to, um, to make da'wah for him. It's a good chance. And, and we should do that. Yes. We should do that. But go into their celebrations, and there's a lot of munkarat, khamar, it's to hizab the religion. So many kabair are taking place, ikhtilat, and at the top of the list is the kufri. So we can't use this type of thing, you know, it's for da'wah. You know, I always tell people who are reverse, what happens? Should we attend the funerals of our relatives? Yeah, go to the funeral. But validate your presence. When they have the eulogy, ask them that you speak about your uncle who died, your brother who died. And then when you start speaking, you get them down. So you validated your presence there. As for going and just sitting there like that and you just, then I would say no. And then we have some people, if you don't go, your mother and your father is going to cut you off. Now we say, hey, go and attend because it's a fitness if they cut you off. So don't get me wrong, and I don't apologize. I don't say that we can't be wise and take these opportunities to give them dawah, but make sure that's what you're doing. You're giving them dawah, and you're not uh, just being there and all those things are going on, and Allah is just going to ask you about your presence. You know? So uh, there's a question came to the Sheikh. Should Elias Kamrani be boycotted after his comments on TV Elias Karmani, Hafidullah Ta'ala, wa Ghafarullah Lana, wa Nahu. He's a member of our community. I don't know what comments he made on TV. The last time that I saw him on TV, he was talking about uh, why some Asian kids become radicalized and extreme. When I listened to that and I saw that, I understood what he was saying and I didn't take offense to it. I understood clearly what he was saying. And I think it was in Ramadan, I'm pretty sure it was in Ramadan that program came on. And then I took a trip to Bradford to break my fast with a group of brothers I had met in Bradford, about 12 of them, I hadn't met them before. And the issue came up. And when the issue came up, they were very upset. And it was my first time seeing his statements in the context of how they took it. That in places like Rochdale, the news and the media are saying that there are Asian gangs that 
are running, uh, making young white British girls do this and do that. So when Elias said what he said, some people felt that he was by feeding into that narrative. I never felt that way myself when I heard that because it's not my issue as such. But when I got with people, that was a sensitive, to the, sensitive issue to them. So I understood. And that's part of the nuance of different people. The person from, the, from Kurdistan, if you say something, he's sensitive to it because it's him. The guy who's from Syria, Iraq, sensitive because it's touching him in a different way. In a different way. When we talk about ISIS, and we talk always against ISIS, always. But we have to make a distinction between ISIS of Syria and ISIS of Al Iraq. I mean, ISIS is ISIS, but sometimes in Al Iraq, you have those people who curse the companions who will kill you, or you have ISIS who fight them. So you have to figure out which one is the lesser of the two evils. So the point is, people are sensitive. So I understand what people were sensitive about. But that's not something that we boycott a person from, for. We have to look at his whole body of work while he got into as a councilman or whatever he is exactly and see what has he done for the community to help and what has he done against the community to hurt it, for an example. And if we find he did more good, he spoke clear with clarity about the deed and what's good, then why boycott him? Maybe he deserves to be boycotted. I don't know, because I'm not watching it like that. But from what I know of the brother, I don't think he was compromising. But in saying that, if you're going to be a politician, it's, it's, it's the rules of engagement that is hard to be clear. I don't know if you guys know, but Obama at one time was a conscientious person. He was a politician in Illinois, in Chicago where there's a large African-American community. He spoke on behalf and in favor of African-American. He spoke and he defended the Palestinian cause very vocally, very loud. But now as the president, he can't even say anything. He doesn't say anything, because that's the nature of politics. Anyway, don't be so quick to boycott people. Brothers, do you have any questions or should I just go through with the questions that I have at the moment? Yes. One thing that surprises me, and I would like to say aggressive problem. Most of the times, coming into a mosque and you are praying in the same room with other people, and they are always trying to avoid you, touching them or getting closer to them, and uh, it's a very serious issue. Some of them might not understand how important it is to be, to be, to be closer to your fellow Muslims, and what good would it do to you? Certainly not the people who are not putting their feet next to the one who is their neighbor in the Salat. This is an issue that goes against the Sunnah and it is a problem. It is a big issue. It has serious ramifications. But what we should understand is it's your job, it's my job to fear Allah to the best of our ability. All you can do is advise the brother. This is the Medhat of the Ahnad. Hanafi people, that's their medhab. And in that medhab, some good scholars who we respect, they took some of those positions that those Hanafi people are upon. You come into the masjid and you see the Imam praying Salatul Fajr and the Jamaat has started and some brother go in the back and he starts doing two rakat sunnah. When you see that, we say, what are you doing? There are some great scholars who took those positions. Now, I don't care how great the scholar is, what the Prophet said to do is what should be done, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when you find people following a scholar who is of good repute and so forth and so on, then you have to take it easy a little bit. Take it easy a little bit. Because if you attack that guy, you look at this brother who's doing this, you don't know, you're dumb, you don't like the sunnah, then that ruling goes back to that scholar. He doesn't know. So we just have to do the best that we can. And don't be like the person who, when he moves away, you keep opening your feet, keep opening your feet, keep opening your feet, and you pray like that. And all you're worrying about it, that all he's worrying about is his salat. He's not even praying anymore. And that's what the Prophet said. He said, he said that these spaces 
He said, close the spaces and don't leave them for the shaitan. Don't leave them for the shaitan. He said, if you don't straighten out your lines and part of straightening is coming together, Allah will cause your hearts to be divided. So when you pray next to a brother who's like that, you're not feeling him. And he's not feeling you because he feels like you're trying to impose your way on him. And this is his deen. This is what he knows. But the people who are doing that, they don't have any delil from the sunnah. The Hanafis don't have any delil from the sunnah to do what they're doing. Where That's why some say you should be four fingers apart, you should be five fingers like this apart, you should be two hands apart. Well, which one is it? Because it's just kalam and ijtihad. So in a case like that, when the person comes to it, he sees that the sunnah is against it, it has to be from Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. Connect the jama'ah in salah and follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and don't follow the bidhat when it's clearly wrong. Thank you. Please. Brothers, any questions? Please. I'll go with the question here inshallah. Uh, which is the best way to deal with hypocrites? Are we allowed to keep friends with them? <laughs> <laughs> The real hypocrite, the real hypocrite. No one knows who the real hypocrite is. Allah knew who the real hypocrites are. And the Prophet knew وسلم, because Allah allowed him to know. So the hypocrite is the one who has kufr inside of his heart. And Al Islam outside. Yaquluna bi al sinatihim. They say with their tongues what is not in their hearts. And no one has been sent with the responsibility of opening up someone's chest to look and to see, is he really a Muslim or not? So when the Prophet wasallam dealt with the hypocrites this way, he knew who they were, but he only told one companion, Huvayfa ibn al-Yaman. He said, these are the hypocrites. And don't tell nobody who they are. He didn't tell the companions, he's a hypocrite, he's a hypocrite. He didn't tell them that. So he taught us by not telling them, it's not, no one knows who the hypocrites are. But we know that there are some signs of the hypocrites. Sign of the hypocrite, if he speaks, he lies. If he promises, he breaks his promise. If you leave him with a trust, he'll break it. If he argues with you, he will become very abusive verbally. They don't think about Allah, Allah in their salah. They stand up to pray. They are lazy. The hypocrite, he divides the Muslim. There's a masjid called Masjid al-Dirar. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا دِرَارًا وَتَفْرِيقًا دِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They made a masjid to, set, to, to split up the Muslims. So if you're in the masjid, always being disruptive and causing a problem, that's a sign of the hypocrite. So the scholars came, they wrote books, signs of the hypocrites. And there are a lot. But who doesn't have some of the signs of the hypocrite? Who, who, who doesn't have some of the signs of the hypocrite? The prophet said, if he speaks, he lies. So the Lord is a, lying is a part of our culture. It's part of the culture. Even if you don't want to lie, you're going to go down there and you're going to tell him, can you increase my dough because uh, this, that, this, that. And you're telling the truth. It's lying. It's not permissible to lie like that. With your uh, CV, when you want to get the job, you're going to inflate it. You're going to say you have this skill and that skill. You know him. He's proficient at uh, Windows or something like that. He doesn't know anything about Windows except how to spell it. He's talking about something else. But he says those things like that. He yeah, I speak four languages. English. Black American slang. <laughs> That's how people are. So, I want to tell the sister, be very careful of this stuff. How do we deal with the hypocrites? We don't know who the hypocrites are. Now, if you hear someone profess kufr, he professed it. It's like the sun in the sky. He said something that there's no way of giving him a break. And the way he behaves, and that's something else. But hypocrites don't show you that much in that side of them. Shaykh Mujah, inshallah, I'm going to take two more questions. Brothers, do you have any questions? Shaykh, it's okay. If you 
I'd like to listen to the talk now and it, your wudu breaks. Do you go and make the wudu there and then once in the masjid or do you wait for the talk to finish? You know smart here, but what's the... So the brother is asking basically, Sheikh, uh, in the talk, if his wudu is broken, should he go and do it or should he wait? Up to you. The issue is why. It's why is here. It's up to you. Because there are proofs for both things that you're doing is okay. As for the one who gets up and he goes to make the wudu again, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that only the believer takes care of the wudu, which is a sign of Ahl Sunnah, cleanliness. La yuhafid al wudu in al mu'min. Only the mu'min is taking care of that wudu, meaning he does it right and he does it the correct way without wasting water. And he tries his best to have wudu in those times that the Prophet said, like when you go to bed and stuff like that, when you read the Quran, things like that, and to be in wudu as much as possible without any difficulty. And also, the person is in salat. As long as he stays in the masjid and he stays in his place and he's making the dhikr of Allah and he's in the malaika asking Allah to forgive him. So if he has that wudu, that's his reward. If he, so if he gets up to go make wudu to come back again, inshallah, He'll continue. But then right now, there's no salat now. So he doesn't have to have wudu. And he tried to hold it as much as possible. And Allah doesn't burden a person beyond his soul. So the person who's sitting there and he has that thing, oh, I'm, I, I got to let it out right now. <laughs> and this happens. But I bring to your attention the nonsense, the extreme wudu that people have in our imams. When they say things like, Imam Abu Hanifa, he made the same salat for 40 years. He made salat for 40 years with the same wudu. Well, who can do that? We didn't find that from Rasulullah sallallahu No, no, after I ate what I ate today, I ate what I ate today, the meal that I ate today, we pray. And right away, I'm going to want to relieve myself, release myself from that feeling. But here the Imam had 40 years. We don't have to say crazy things like that, especially when we know our situation. So, Ahi, Al Amru Wazir, it's why? It's up to you, it's easy. MashaAllah. Sheikh, I got a question uh, from a brother. He's saying basically he's been trying to practice his religion for two years, and um, he's a MashaAllah, he's a born Muslim, but he's trying to stay away from the fitna of the women, and he fell into the fitna so many times. So he said, MashaAllah, he tried with the brothers, and um, I think. He's basically asking for uh, How, what should you do in this situation? I think that it's important Ahi, that you surround yourself when you're outside in the fitna. You surround yourself with people who are trying to practice this religion. They won't allow you to be that way. They'll help you, inshallah, against yourself, against your own nafs, and you'll help them as well. So when a person has good companions, one of the benefits of those companions is that they help you. Another thing is, again, what the Prophet told the people to do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You're at that age, you're that young, fast, man. Try, try to fast, try. Don't be one of those people who just say, I uh, wanted to practice the religion for two years, but I've been having trouble and stuff like that. But you didn't even give fasting a chance. Because those kinds of ibadat, like hajj fasting, is one that requires some effort. You exert energy and effort. So when you do it, you're at a heightened level of spirituality. You're more cognizant of doing right and doing wrong. So try to do that. And then we can't forget the importance of a dua, a dua. That you make dua for yourself, your parents make dua for you as well. Like the young man who came and said, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission. I'm going to make zina. So that young man was going through what our young people go through. It's normal, it's natural. But he didn't want to, he didn't want to fall into it. He was sincere. And his sincerity pushed him in front of all of the people to say, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission. I just want to do it just to get it off of me and I won't do it again. And then he say, no, 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 no. You don't want people to do that to your mother, your sister, your aunties. You don't want. He said, no, I don't want that. And then the Prophet brought him to him and he made dua for him. He made dua for him. And asked Allah to take that thing out of that boy. And then it was taken away. So you make dua for yourself. You ask Allah. Let that thing be an issue that uh, encourages you in your salah. Like when you're praying Dhuhr and Asr, those quiet prayers. Think about how weak you are and how miskin you are. 
and that you need Allah's help. And let that be something that causes you to cry. Because you miss key. You can't even help yourself in an issue like that. I knew some brothers who were doing that in Al Medina. They used to cry for Salat al Buhr and Asr. I thought it was amazing. I can see someone crying because the Imam's recitation is beautiful. So it affects you. And we didn't even know in Arabic that at that time. But this brother used to cry for Salat al Buhr and Asr. So I had to ask him, why are you, why you cry all the time like that? He said, man, I, I'm in that stage right now where I, I want to get married, but I don't have the money. I can't get married. I'm all the way over here in Saudi Arabia. These Arabs are not marrying me to their daughters, so I'm not getting married anytime soon. I'm just stuck right now, and I need help. He said, so every time I think about that, I just think, oh, Lord, I need help, I need help. And that was how he was crying. I said, wow. So now I'm using that advice because it helped that brother. Hey guys, may Allah Azza wa accept it from you guys. Stay on the Sunnah, be on the Sunnah, be on the Sunnah with balance. Don't apologize to people about the truth and be tolerant of people. Be tolerant of yourselves, the other Muslims who are under other stuff even. Be tolerant of our elders, the way things are going. But little by little, inshallah, little by little consistency, little by little, you guys hopefully will uh, uh, see the fruits of your uh, of your efforts in the future. But please, please, if you don't do anything else, stay on the sunnah in a balanced way, without apologizing. We don't want those people who go too far to the right. They want to murder everything. They want to murder Pina. They want to murder everything. And then the other guys who go too far to the left, and they apologize about everything in their religion. Us praying five prayers, they apologize for that. Everything. Just be right in the middle, guys. هذا وصلى الله وصل مبارك على نبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. زكى مرة أخرى فتى نبى بعض السستس من الله سبحانه وتعالى أن give us إن شاء الله time to come to more talks. جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.